Good afternoon. It's October 24th, 2016. My name is Matthew Ogden, and uh, you're joining us for our weekly discussion here with the LaRouche PAC Policy Committee. I'm in the studio with Jason Ross from the LaRouche PAC Science Team, and joining us via video are the six members of our policy committee. We have Bill Roberts joining us from Detroit, Michigan. Dave Christie joining us from Seattle, Washington. Diane Sayer joining us from New York City. Uh, Keisha Rogers joining us from Houston, Texas. Michael Steger joining us from San Francisco, California. And Rachel Brinkley joining us from Boston, Massachusetts. So I think uh, as we discussed just uh, a few minutes ago on a call that we had with Lyndon and Helga LaRouche, uh, it's very clear that all of the institutions that are associated with the current transatlantic system, the Obama administration, uh, are in the process of crumbling, disintegration. And we've really reached a point where a total paradigm shift, as Helga LaRouche has called for it very clearly, uh, is urgently necessary and is really potentially very close at hand. Uh, we just saw the uh, latest news with the rejection of this Canada-Europe transatlantic um, tr free trade agreement, which has been torpedoed because of a decision in the Walloon uh, regional parliament in Belgium. Uh, that's just the latest of these dramatic developments that, that prove that the so-called veneer of the European Union is completely gone. And then you've got the ongoing disintegration of Deutsche Bank and these other major transatlantic Wall Street financial institutions. Now, uh, here in the United States, it's very clear that uh, Obama's legacy is now being proven to be exactly what LaRouche called it out to be from the very beginning. Uh, you've got the entire Obamacare disaster, where Obamacare is really on the verge of uh, complete disintegration. The premiums are going through the roof. Uh, they are going up 50, 60 percent again this year, uh, year on year. And at the same time, you had a uh, expose over the weekend, a multi-page multi expose in the Washington Post on this op opioid crisis, which has now reached uh, dramatic proportions. And there's a very clear connection in com criminal complicity of the big pharmaceutical companies with these uh, black market uh, op opioid uh, doctors who are uh, funneling this into the mass, mass population. Now, not coincidentally, at the same time in Afghanistan, you've got a dramatic increase in the production and the productivity of the opium, the heroin production coming out of Afghanistan, which shows you the consequence of the Obama-British uh, war policy there. And then uh, I think as is very clear, you've got a total realignment of the entire world situation uh, at hand with, uh, as very clearly demonstrated, the denunciation by Duterte of the entire Obama, Bush, uh, Tony Blair war crime uh, process in terms of their violations of international law uh, over the last 15 years, and then his announcement that he is realigning the Philippines with China and abandoning this alliance that Obama had uh, been taking for granted to use as a warfare operation against China and the entire Euro uh, Asia pivot. Now, uh, as I said in the very beginning, and as Helga and Lyndon LaRouche were clear, um, the new paradigm is close at hand. And I think this was very dramatically demonstrated over the weekend with two breakthrough conferences back to back in Europe, uh, both sponsored by the Schiller Institute, one in Essen, Germany, and uh, another one in Lyon, France. And these included participation from Lyndon LaRouche, Helga LaRouche, Jacques Cheminade, who is a candidate for president in France, and uh, many representatives of leading embassies, Chinese embassy, Ethiopian embassy, others, and people from the technology sector. And then here in the United States, as we elaborated on Friday, we are in the midst of launching a major mobilization around Lyndon LaRouche's four economic laws, and the Hamilton Economic Reports. And we have a new mobilization page. We're gonna display it on the screen right now. Uh, this is at the LaRouche PAC Action Center. Um, as you can see, we have motivation here uh, for you to join our mobilization. <laughs> uh, make, no, uh, make no delay, action.larouchepac.com slash four laws. And we've got 
we've got uh, all of the available material that you need on that page, including Mr. LaRouche's four laws paper and the four economic reports from Alexander Hamilton. So we ask you to join our mobilization uh, and go to that website, action.larouchepack.com slash four laws. So with that said, I think we can uh, begin today's discussion. Well, I think our initial um, caption was highly appropriate. <laughs> uh, and everybody should get themselves in gear right now because Obama and the British empire that he represents are really finished. They cannot salvage this system. They can threaten war as much as they want. They could even plunge us into thermonuclear war. That danger is not over. But uh, I think it's really important for us to get Americans thinking of the way to solve this and thinking of the arc, which is far above the pathetic um, soap opera circus clown show that is called the presidential election, which has caused so many people to be so stressed out and despairing. The United States has a history of change, which actually is not necessarily associated with president, presidential candidates or occupants of the White House. If you think of the American Revolution itself, George Washington, who became president, was obviously a critical figure, but so was Benjamin Franklin, who never held office, and Alexander Hamilton, who came in as the first Treasury Secretary, but who played the uh, prominent, most critical role in the framing of our Constitution and establishing an economic policy. You had the civil rights movement in this country with Martin Luther King, uh, which greatly transformed the United States. And you also had the space program where Kennedy's leadership was actually, was absolutely critical, but the inspirational factor of that is is much beyond. And I, I think what we saw with what happened with JASTA, uh, the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, is you have the ability, thanks to Alexander Hamilton's work, that an insane president, namely Barack Obama, had his uh, head handed to him, so to speak, by the Congress, which was moved by the LaRouche movement, members of the 9-11 families, and a certain sense of justice and a cultural shift which has been underway here in Manhattan. So I think it's very important that uh, Americans now begin to think instead of looking behind you uh, and being like those runners that are not even in Dante's circles of the inferno, but the people who are running around with their heads facing in the wrong direction and tears streaming down their back, uh, you don't want to be like that. Better to look to the future. Look at what China is doing with their space launch missions, their commitment to explore the universe. Look at what President Putin has been doing, which is extraordinary in the face of the insane actions by Obama and NATO and others, and fight with us, with the LaRouche Pack, with the material that we are providing on the website to transform the United States in exactly this direction that Alexander Hamilton would be leading us were he alive today. Well, Mr. LaRouche made the point this weekend that we have to go after Congress and humiliate them, um, that the time has come, um, that, that we need to tell them what they should have been doing this whole time, you know, because this is obvious now, you know, as Matt brought up about Obama's legacy, the same thing for the Congress that allowed him to do all of this. You know, they should have been standing up to shut down Wall Street. They should have been, you know, standing up to the two uh, wars without intelligence. Uh, this was just done in the in the British House of Commons. They said, we went into Libya on false intelligence and they forced David Cameron to resign. Uh, in the un United States, we are, we're doing this today. Um, you know, the United States is refusing to allow humanitarian corridors to function in Syria. We're going after Russia. 
saying Russia is, is the humanitarian problem in Syria, while we refuse to let uh, citizens leave, leave Aleppo by separating the terrorists. This is, you know, so this is going on today. Um, so the point is, is that this Congress should be humiliated uh, if they intend to sit around a another second and just simply not speak out on these essential, I mean, it's just obvious what needs to be said. So uh, yeah, it's time for people uh, to, to enforce this as well. I think it's it's been very valuable. I think across the country, we announced it on the uh, the Friday webcast, but we have a, a new Hamiltonian page, and um, that goes through the the various papers by Alexander Hamilton and, and Mr. Larouche's four laws. But in and along with that, we've had now Hamilton readings of his actual papers throughout the country. I know this has been done in New York for the last couple of weeks. It's been done out in Houston and in the, in the West Coast. And I'm sure in many parts of the country. And there's something that's very striking about Hamilton's writings because he's he's not talking about um, the theoretically perfect economic system for all time. He's specifically dealing with a crisis, a crisis point in the country where you've got to address a problem. You've got to address the breakdown of the country. You've got to address political attacks against the country. But in there is a universal quality. And what Hamilton captures is clearly not just a banking system, not just the basic steps that any sovereign people would adopt to ensure that they can develop their country. He also recognizes that the way you're going to think about a banking or economic or financial system is from the standpoint of human culture. That you're actually wanting your, the individuals and citizens involved in your country to be up, uplifted into a higher quality of culture itself towards where is, where is our civilization going over the coming generations? What are we investing in today that will ensure that the lives that you live today or the lives that have been lived in the past will have enduring meaning for the future. And that you actually begin to inspire your population and your nation around that kind of conception of identity. And that really is, I think that stands out as Hamilton's genius, and that very much is what Lynn has uh, brought forward with his four laws and the intervention we've made over these last 25 years to bring together the Russia-China perspective today globally. So I think that quality really stood out, I think, of in the discussions on Hamilton's papers. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right because once again, uh, you, LaRouche has uniquely defined the terms of the fight right now in terms of the fact that the focus on Hamilton and the principal fight that Hamilton led as LaRouche is continuing today is on the question of the nature of man. Uh, and I think it's going to be a, a very important knockout, drag out fight right now to come to understand who is going to represent the true legacy of Alexander Hamilton as applies to the needs for today, just as Hamilton understood that you cannot have a, a, a system that treats human beings, any human beings as slaves or promote slavery, uh, today that same agenda is right up front and that's what the people joining with the new global alignment uh, represented by China in their development of promoting the creativity and the progress uh, produ productivity of each member of its society and also throughout the world that you're seeing with the offer of cooperation in the space program, the offer of cooperation in the uh, Silk Road development plan that, you know, you look at what the president of the Philippines, Duterte, just represented was a, a courage that now has to be taken up by other nations, including the United States, to say we're not going to be the, you know, puppets to an imperial policy, we're going to join with an alliance for cooperation, for development, and for progress. And most nations recognize that this is the right thing to do. Uh, but I, I think it's going to be very important that, as Mr. LaRouche has emphasized the strategy for saving the United States and thus saving the rest of the world, starting with his four laws, uh, Glass-Steagall, and a return to the Hamiltonian principles that 
shape this nation and that are the defining point for a real economy, as LaRouche has described, uh, the, that, that's the fight right now. I, I know that many people saw or some people may still be looking at this uh, joke of, you know, the Hamilton uh, movie Broadway show that's continuing to dominate and I think that's important because there's a lot of misnomers, lies, and all kinds of misinformation that has been put out there uh, in terms of what Hamilton really represented. You know, that he was for the British and he was for the stock market and for a monetary economy, which is completely not true. And as Mr. LaRouche has waged the fight that the real understanding of Hamilton's policies based on this protection and defense of the identity of the human mind and of the identity of you know real creative progress in society has to be put at the forefront uh, and that's that's what you see right now coming from the challenge that both China Russia these leading nations are represented are representing in defiance to the war policy and destructive policy you see coming from Obama and um, from the transatlantic system which is completely gone away from this Hamiltonian tradition which we are now fighting and standing up front to, to defend. Yeah I think coming back back to what Michael had said that this is what Hamilton did was part of a discussion process and it was an active uh, it was an, an active um, well, discussion on how the hell do we secure the nation? Uh, that was what Hamilton was, was dealing with as it was a, a developing process. They had won the American Revolution, but they had by no means secured the Republic. And uh, clearly the, the reports that he was delivering to the, to the Congress were very much as an, they were organizing reports. It was, it was an organizing process of Hamilton recruiting people to a mission of how do you actually secure independence from the British Empire. And I think that's important because what people who are engaged in a dialogue with Mr. LaRouche, who are supporters of the LaRouche Pack, who are who should really begin to think of themselves as leaders, and not just leaders in their nation, but leaders of an international process. Because I think similarly as Hamilton led the discussion in the nation back then, we are in the process of leading a, an international discussion. And, and I think we've come to the point now where, uh, you know, somewhat what, what uh, Abraham Lincoln had said, that, you know, the, the, you can no, no longer have a nation half slave, half free. Well, we're at a point where you can no longer have a world half slave, half free. And, and I think that's what's at the core of the brawl around the new paradigm and what is you know being implemented by the BRICS and this this outlook which says we're not going to submit to a neo-colonial policy in fact as Keisha mentioned uh you know Duterte has become somewhat of a hero uh I, I know Robert Mugabe one of the leaders in uh, of the uh, of Africa just said it in general um or of the nation of Africa um said it in general that uh, Duterte is should is a hero because he's saying what all of us would like to say. And, and I think that that's the same uh, recognition of the same fight that is underway of freeing ourselves from the grip of this imperial policy. And, you know, I think one of the ways that it's come up recently is uh, both a report in uh, Oxford University put out a report on how China's infrastructure program, they're overextended, they're about to uh, crumble. The Financial Times had a similar article, and it was, I, I think, very striking from the Financial Times article. One of the, I know we've discussed this before, but one of the um, uh, responses coming from China was, well, look, we don't consider that we are at risk because we have a different sense of risk. We don't look for short-term gains. We don't look to the past. We're looking at what this infrastructure does to create a future potential growth. 
And I think that goes very much to the fact that this discussion that Mr. LaRouche has initiated around Hamilton, but really as his four laws indicate a kind of a distillation of that same principle, um, that that is what these nations are grappling with in a real time battle as for, the, for the, the fight against the British Empire, that it's now at the point where we can no longer have half the world gripped by empire and half the world not. It was one of these two systems has to win out. And that's the, that's what we, the discussion that we're leading internationally. Maybe just to add to that a little bit, um, you know, at a, at a certain point, it's true, it, it just becomes a, an absurdity for some of the leaders of these countries to look at the world situation. Like Duterte, for example, he's saying, okay, if I remain allied primarily with the United States, there's no development. We're being used as um, a partner to basically start a war with China, which would be thermonuclear war. You know, that's a great military alliance. It's an alliance that will, if we're ever need to involve the United States in the defense of our country, it's going to be in a war with China, which is going to be thermonuclear extinction for humanity. Our country is completely flooded with drugs. You've got 4% of our population hooked on drugs. Um, and then, you know, for him, I mean, he said the breaking point was that at the point he started, he came in and started taking on these, these drug deals. It's accused of basically international war crimes by countries that have been involved in murder operations across the planet. And he basically said, if anyone can convince me that the operations of the United States in the West, in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, are not, you know, insane war crimes, that if anyone can convince me of that, then I will gladly, you know, resign my post. So, I, you know, I think... It's true. At a, at a certain point, it just becomes, I think the way Mr. LaRouche put it, is that you just, Obama is so far out there. This establishment is so far exposed in terms of just the fact that they are insane, that it is just so obvious. And they, he just, they do not have the partners that they need anymore uh, to carry out what they're proposing. So, you know, we need to give the American population what they need to sort of break the the paralysis of a belief in this system, which really just it's 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 a uh, it's a shadow at this point, um, and we need to give people a, a, the substance. And what's the human identity represented or embodied in the governing system of political affairs? I mean, if you think about the way that LaRouche has adopted Hamilton's approach in his own four laws and the way that Mr. LaRouche having advanced on Hamilton is able to get very directly at the human identity from the standpoint of our ability to make discoveries that transform the relationship of our species to nature. Something that Hamilton certainly recognizes existing as he discusses in his report on manufacturers with the ability to develop new technologies that transform uh, the productive process. But I think that what Mr. LaRouche has done with that really raises the question then of what is the, really, what's the goal, what's the purpose of society? I mean, there's more to life than, you know, being wealthy. Um, there is something that you can do when you've got access to a enduring immortal mission for the human species as seen in great works as seen in the periods of renaissance as seen in the space program for example being able to participate in these things that have a value outside of and beyond your life you know that is the that's the real and the highest objective so must poverty be eliminated of course do we need infrastructure do we need to develop the projects of the World Land Bridge? Of course we do. Do we need federal credit to make that a possibility here in the United States? Yes. Is the point of these projects to have a faster train? No. We need that, but that's not the point of it. The point of it is by bringing in the discoveries that we've made, by mediating those technologies' ability to have an impact on 
our relationship to nature through things like the infrastructure that we use every day and through things like the highest levels of manufacturing in the machine tool process where the highest level of, of newly applied technologies can have an impact that then moves down the productive stream you know the ability to participate in changing those kinds of things you know that's really what we want people increasingly to be able to become a a part of and if you look at the identity the human identity reflected in us current policy of maintaining hegemony by preventing the development of others what kind of identity is that as a person somebody who identifies themselves as being superior to others and could bolster that identity by keeping them down. What kind of identity is that? Contrast that with the identity represented in the projects of the World Land Bridge, the outlook of the new Silk Road that the LaRouches have been promoting for decades. If you think about that outlook of what it represents as what you are as a human being, and you think about implementing that vision of the human individual, you can get another type of respect or appreciation for what these policies really mean. It's the bringing into being of the true nature, the dignified, meaningful nature of the human individual. I think this is really uh, critical, and it's also really critical in terms of getting a um, sensuous grasp of what Obama represents. LaRouche has continued to bring up the Tuesday kill sessions. And it should be noted that the number of drone strikes on people, unknown people, that we have no basis to know whether they were guilty of anything or not, increased at least eightfold under Obama after the Bush administrations. And that he had these Tuesday sessions where he would decide upon whom he killed. And at points, I guess, in 2011, the number of drone strikes per month was as high as 1,000, which is 33 per day, which if each of them killed only one person would be hideous, but many of them killed dozens of people or even hundreds of people. And this has not yet been stopped. Um, I was speaking with someone yesterday who happens to be a, an educator who said that in his mind the metric of the kind of deadness of the American people morally or emotionally is what they tolerate happening to children. That if you can't respond when children are drowning in the Mediterranean or children in our own cities are being shot in you know flyby bullets of shootings that were intended for other people or even themselves or uh you know the fact that rather than educate children we're supposed to be putting them on ritalin or other kinds of drugs uh if you've lost your relationship to the future of a child in a sense you've lost your relationship to what it means to be human and from that standpoint then the evil of Obama falling upon the evil of the Bush administration may not be as visceral, as viscerally clear to you as it should be. And I was thinking of the power of what was done in the Manhattan area with these four performances of the Mozart Requiem, but also the importance of preceding the Requiem with the African American spirituals because because the music is in English and because people have a certain sense of identity that this came from the United States, it came from our forebears in some way, there's a certain resonance. Many people describe that hearing the spirituals prepared them to better hear or better participate because the audience is not a passive listener. They are a participant in a performance of a great classical composition. And that this serves the purpose of reminding people of what it actually means to be a human being. And the power of the spirituals in particular is that the, the music uh, was created by people who were asserting and 
demonstrating their immortal face of the most barbaric attempted, as Frederick Douglass said explicitly, attempted in every possible way to enforce, to impose upon people that they were not humans, that they were merely animals. And what you hear in the music is a very calm assertion of the question of the immortality of mankind. A sense exactly what is needed today. Yeah, in terms and your line is breaking up. Yes. Then maybe I should stop and you should go ahead. Can I be heard now? Yes, go ahead, Diane. Yes. Yes, okay. At any rate, this question of the, um, the identity, as Jason was saying, of what it means to be human and the music as a very powerful reminder, which is perhaps more direct for people to access than other means, which are were equally profound and necessary, like the insight of a scientific discovery, or as we're seeing in Manhattan, the reading of Hamilton's original writings. But I think that it's we have to quickly remind people of their identity and get them to act on behalf of that and not anything on a lower level. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, because you are dealing with the universality of the creative nature of mankind. I mean, these African-American spirituals, I agree, it was very important to begin those concerts with that because it immediately connects the audience into the music and makes them active participants and not just spectators. But these have universal implications. This is a universal music. Even though you might have a specific music which is of the idiom of a particular time and a particular place and a particular people, it still has a universal uh, quality to it. You know, Helga LaRouche was telling us at this conference in Essen, there was a musical performance by a Chinese singer who sang a German art song by Franz Schubert in German, but with accompaniment by traditional Chinese musical instruments. And that's, I mean, she said it was an incredible effect. I'm looking forward to hearing that. But I think that speaks to the very universality of exactly what the conference itself was intended to embody, which is Germany must join the Silk Road, Germany must join in an alliance with China, and this is the future. It's funny that something from 200 years in the past can be the future of mankind, like a Schubert art song or a African-American spiritual or the Requiem by Mozart. And it speaks to the fact that there is something universal which transcend, transcends the idiom of a particular culture or the time and place of a particular musical composition. I think Hamilton has the same effect, really. Um, if you look at the policies of China, in a very real way, there are Hamiltonian principles which are being embodied by what China is pursuing right now, even though it's a completely different time in history, a completely different situation. There are universals when it comes to economic principle that apply across place and across time. Yeah, I, I mean, this question of the music, it has a, there, there's been a real resonance in it, and it, we can't, the, the resonance of it continues as we, as the concerts demonstrated in New York. I think it's worth just kind of putting it in a context, because the last 50 years of transatlantic civilization have been a dark age. There's been no mission. It's been a culture dominated by a, a, an attack specifically on the human mind. And Obama probably is the uh, epitome of this attack. Uh, this is a, a presidency brought in by drug money, by Go George Soros, by the banks, by the drug money. His entire health care pro program was based on base a palliative drug care, basically painkillers. So it's not surprising that over his presidency there's been more than a tripling of addictions to painkillers across the country. I mean, there's really is, there's a destruction. Then you've got the collapse of Obamacare, which is for good reason. This is because people don't want to be killed by unnecessarily. They, they, want, they want a chance to participate in something truthful. And I think the music and these concerts have captured that. 
It was also interesting at the Saturday Manhattan discussion, there were a number of young people participating. There's a, a living sense, I think, in some of these younger members of our society who are now the grandchildren of baby boomers who spent most of their life probably on some kind of drug, on Ritalin or Adderall or these ADD prescriptions or whatever else people are prescribed. You have a, you have a sense that this is not, this is not human. And the same thing is happening now. You see the fight in the Philippines. I was just struck. You think about this fight from Duterte and the Philippines. It's specifically on the drugs. That's where the West freaked out. That's where they couldn't handle it. And they, put, they jeopardized their entire Asia pivot, the entire TPP program, on the specific question that Duterte was going to shut down the drugs and the drug culture. And you realize how sensitive of an issue this is because if you take out the drug culture, you take out the insensitivity to man's condition. You take out a, a kind of a renewed sense of optimism that's possible. And the musical concerts, this Hamiltonian policy really captures that quality. So I think we should probably get our congressmen off drugs or get them out of office or get them off drug money and begin to recognize that we can restore this country. It's very possible. Um, if, we, if we are willing to go at it at the, at the deepest level of what's really been done these last 50 years, because it's been an all-out dark age, except for what Mr. LaRouche and this organization have done, there has not been a mission. There's not been something uniquely human in Western culture. And we're lucky, we're fortunate that that quality of mission has arisen now in China and in Asia, because it's giving us an opportunity here to pull up a remarkable change in policy and orientation. As I say, we had the first pothead as president. Just the legalization of drugs. Look, I mean, California is going to legalize. This is 40 million people. This is 15 plus percent of the college students in the country are in California. And Obama is going to what? Colorado, Washington. It's going to be Oregon, California. It's going to be like 10 states after this election, possibly legalizing pot. I mean, you've got a program of just a deep, deep attempt to destroy the population as quickly as possible. And I think. More Americans have to have a sense. We're going to implement fundamental changes of financial policy to shut down this financial bankruptcy, but we're going to have to go through a, a total shift in cultural orientation and rebuilding our nation's sense of identity and a commitment to mankind's future. That really is what's at stake, and that's exactly what our enemy has attempted to destroy these last 50 years since Kennedy's assassination. Yeah, it's true. That's what uh, Duterte recognized, is that when... Um, the attack was on the next generation because, you know, when he decided that he was going to take on the drug um, lords and the drug apparatus in his country and say, you're not going to mess with the minds of the young people, uh, that's, he, know, he knows uh, that that is the fight, that that's what the British Empire, Obama, they're out to destroy. That's what China understands. That's why they're moving rapidly to increase the numbers of young people who are uh, being developed in uh, the necessary breakthroughs, scientific breakthroughs in the fields of science, in the fields of, um, uh, in, in all fields of, of scientific development, and giving them an opportunity through the participation in making the discoveries around what will advance their space program, but that this drug question is very important and, and emphatic, that if you have the United States, which you brought up at the beginning of the discussion, Matt, is completely being taken over by the destruction of its youth and the whole nation by this drug apparatus, and nations around the world recognize that this is the core of the fight right now. Um, that's what we have to really wake up to. Are we going to continue to live and succumb to this, these dark age conditions, or are we going to uh, say that this is not about ourselves, this is not self-survival, uh, this is not about legislation or any of that per se, but the question is, this is the youth, this is the future of the nation and the future of the world that's on the line right now. And I think that just puts the fight very much um, direct on the table. 
you know, just to say a nation that engages in extrajudicial drone killings on a daily basis really has no basis to criticize <laughs> the Philippine government on extrajudicial killings. But the, I mean, if you look at the pace of world history, I think it's always useful to look at just the uh, rapidity at which things are developing um, every single step along the way. And I think increasingly so, the Obama administration has been caught completely flat-footed and um, really had no concept that history was moving in the direction that it was going. Um, Brexit was a perfect example. I mean, up till the very last minutes, all the pundits in the polls said, Brexit's not going to happen. You wake up the next morning, Brexit's occurred. Philippines, uh, the State Department spokesman, Kirby, was grilled the next morning at the State Department briefing. And he admitted, we had no idea that this was going to happen, that Duterte was going to go to China and announce that he was separating from the United States and was entering into an alliance with China. I mean, these are massive uh, historical shifts. These are huge developments uh, on the world stage. And this administration has been ca caught completely flat-footed at every single uh, stage of this process. And I think it goes to the point that, as Mr. LaRouche said this weekend, really Obama, the only leverage he has on the world stage right now is to threaten World War III, but his basis for doing so is evaporating uh, right out from underneath of him. I mean, what, what basis does he have to threaten China at this point uh, when the Philippines has abandoned him? What basis does he have to threaten Russia where the rest of the world sees the fact that it's only through Russia's actions in Syria that the threat of ISIS has been destroyed and interrupted. Uh, the, the threats are increasingly empty, especially as the entire transatlantic financial system goes up in smoke and Obama's legacy is proven to be a total disaster domestically and abroad. So I think that the time is very, very ripe for the quality of clear-headed leadership and forward-thinking leadership uh, that's coming from the LaRouche movement. You know, Jason was saying earlier, um, on every element of this program, LaRouche is not a Johnny come lately. I mean, he's been on the ground floor from from day one. The Eurasian land bridge, this realignment around the Russia-India-China alliance, this was something that LaRouche was involved in directly with the Prime Minister of Russia, Yevgeny Primakov, in the 1990s. Uh, Helga LaRouche has been on the on the ground in China for decades, and both of them have made several trips to India, including meeting with the Prime Minister of India, Indira Gandhi, in the 1980s. Uh, when it comes to the future of science and uh, economics, the fusion program and the space program is something that Mr. LaRouche has been directly involved in at the highest presidential levels since at least the 1980s. The founding of the Fusion Energy Foundation was prior to that. Uh, Mr. LaRouche's involvement in the Strategic Defense Initiative and in some of the space exploration programs with the Mars program has been something that he had a uh, outside of government, but a practically presidential level advisory post preparing reports for the Reagan administration on those types of subjects. On every single one of these, the critical groundwork is there. We've been on the ground floor. This four laws program is not something that just was entered into the record, but this is a distillation of decades of economic science and economic work that the LaRouche movement as a whole has invested into taking the principles of Hamilton's economics and applying them to the present day. How does this, how do these universal principles translate into policies for the present? And I think it's really critical what we've done with this uh, mobilization page, action.larouchepack.com slash four laws, we are taking now the pr principles of Alexander Hamilton and through these readings that are happening now increasingly across the country, creating a qualified leadership, a citizen's intelligentsia, a group of people just as Hamilton did at the time of the American Revolution that are able to take on for themselves the responsibility of providing this leadership at this turning point in history. So I just say again, history is moving more rapidly than uh, people in the United States can imagine. It's definitely outpacing the Obama administration and we're moving it rapidly in a direction of a total paradigm shift um, as, we've, as we've repeatedly said.
And don't forget, Dope Inc. was actually banned in the United Kingdom. <laughs> Although the dope wasn't. He likes visiting. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think that's a very good overview. So again, I'm going to put this address up on the screen, and it has several uh, opportunities for you to get involved. Uh, Action.larouchepack.com slash four laws. And uh, we're asking people to write up short reports on their organizing, or hey, if you've organized a reading of the Hamilton papers in your home or in local library or something, write up a little report. There's a place that you can report back to us on what you're doing. There's going to be a couple of reports that are going up there today on current activities around this mobilization. And um, all of the background that you need is there. And please get out. As you as as Rachel said, uh, it's time to um, it's time to light a fire underneath the members of Congress and say this is the time to make this happen. And are you going to be part of the old paradigm? or are you going to be part of the new paradigm? So thank you very much for joining us, and stay tuned to LaRouchePack.com.